Rotura Quest. In our last video, we started to learn about something, deal, some things dealing with the basics of nonverbal communication. And one of the things that we mentioned was that nonverbal communication can be carried through any of the five senses. Any of the five senses, right? So, since nonverbal communication can be carried through any of the five senses, we talked a little bit about how it can be carried through our uh, taste, through our smell. Uh, we talked about how it can be uh, taste, smell, and touch, or what we care talked about last time. In this video, we're going to talk about how nonverbal communication is carried through sight. Most of us actually tend to think about sight when we think about nonverbal communication. Most of us think about the things that we see as what carried the nonverbal clues. When we play poker, we'll talk about the tells, which is another way of saying nonverbal communication, another way of saying delivery. Uh, when we'll talk about those, and usually those are things that we notice with our eyes. Our eyes are, arguably, the most sensitive organ that we have. And because of that, we communicate a lot of information through what we see. One of the ways that we communicate in information is through our kinesic codes. And kinesic codes come in two kinds. There's kinesic code 1 and kinesic code 2. Kinesic code 1 are the, bot, the hand movements and gestures that we use. These are so important in a public speech. In fact, these are one of the most important things about a public speech. Being able to convey information to your audience with your gestures is so important. And there's lots of different kinds of gestures we can use. We can use things like emblems. You've probably seen somebody flash an emblem at you if you've been driving uh, in a city sometime and, and not done a good job about it. That middle finger lifting to the air, that's an emblem. It's not the only kind. Things like going, oh, shame on you. Emblems are nonverbal gestures which are arbitrary but have an... Uh, an accepted social meaning. That doesn't mean they're acceptable in society in the case of like the middle finger, but they have an accepted social meaning. We all know what that means. Illustrators are when you illustrate something with your hands. I say it's this big. Uh, if I say it's that tall. If I say he's as fat as that. Any of these things, these are our illustrators and they let us know things. Regulators are how we know when it's like our turn to communicate. Nodding your head, show, you know, you're listening. And I, I will do that sometimes in a conversation, saying, and I want to get back to that point. When it's my turn, I'm, I'm going to address that. They let you know when it's your turn and what's going to go on. We also have affective displays. Affective displays are little things that we do with our bodies in order to deal with stress. They include our adapters. They adapt to stress and fulfill personal needs. Now well, there's lots of them that you have. One that I have, I like to play with something in my pocket. Uh, every now and then I've, I've got some things. I have a quarter and a little bolt. Uh, those are what are in there and I'll just reach in and play for a little bit just to deal with stress. Uh, sometimes I'll stroke my beard. That doesn't that make me look smart and maybe it does but uh it's really just to deal with stress. It's, it's probably a tell. Now a lot of times with these effective displays, with these adapters, uh, a lot of times people use them when they're lying. But it's not always when they're lying. And so you can't be 100% sure of that because any kind of stressor will cause you to go back to your effective displays, including lying, but not limited to it. Um, we also have Kinesic Code 2. Kinesic Code 2 is our facial expressions. Please think about your facial expressions before you get up and do a speech. Think about what is it you're trying to get across. Because so much information is carried in our faces. And if you forget to, to, to really think about your facial expressions, 
there's a good chance you're not going to be able to give a very good public speech. You need to have appropriate facial expressions for what you're talking about. If you're talking about teen drinking and how lots of people die, this is not the face to be making. Right? But other times you do need to smile because smiling puts yourself at ease, it puts your audience at ease. Talked about that a little bit when we were uh, talking about dealing with anxiety. We also communicate by how we arrange our, our space. If you're taking this class, taking public speaking as an online class, and that's why you're using this video, if that's the case for you, I want you to really think about it. You're going to need an audience for your video. You're going to have to arrange people out in front of you. How do you want to do that? How do you want to make that happen? See, we tell people how and when and where to go by arranging our space in particular ways. Uh, we tell them what they should be doing. Right? If you come into a room and all of the furniture is focused on the TV, is that a good room for conversation? No. Think about that. That's a room for watching TV. Now, watching TV is fine. We create moods, we direct motion, and we command particular uses of space. Have you ever come up to a door and you've grabbed that door and you've pulled and you've pulled and you've pulled and you've gotten so frustrated and then you notice it says push on the side? That's not because you're an idiot. It's because the nonverbal communication of that door, the way the handle was laid out, the way it's laid out in the room, was telling you to pull it. And no amount of verbal communication, the written word pull or push, is going to help. You're going to follow the shape of the door. We create moods, direct motion, and command particular uses through how we set up our space. We also communicate the particular things through body types. You've probably heard that the camera adds about 10 pounds. You know what, though? 10 pounds more or less, I'm still fat. And you know what that means when people see me? Well, let's see, what do you think? You think fat and, think fat and lazy. You think fat and stupid. You think fat and happy. You think fat and dull. See, these are the things you do. Now, your body type, and that's my body type, you may have a very different one. You know, people need to think about what is it that their body type is communicating. There's nothing you can do about it. I mean, I guess I could lose weight, but not in time for my next speech. Um, there's nothing you can really do about it. Your body type is your body type. But you do need to know that your body type is communicating something. If you have an athletic build, that's saying something about you. If you're tall and skinny, that says something about you. Uh, if you, uh, you know are proportioned in particular ways, that's going to communicate different things to different people. Now here's, here's, here's something to remember. It, it's not your fault, but you still have to be aware of it. Your body type is communicating something. So if I want you to not think I'm lazy, to not think I'm boring, to not think I'm stupid, I've got to be a lot more active than maybe somebody else would have to be in these same videos. I'm not telling you that you need to suddenly change your body type for a particular speech. That's not possible. But I am telling you that you need to be aware of it. We also need to be aware of our clothes. In fact, when I saw I was about to do the, the presentation on, uh, on, on communicating nonverbally through sight, I stepped up the wardrobe a little bit, you know, put on a jacket. What do you think? Sometimes I, I wear a tie usually during the semester. I didn't think it was really the right attitude for these videos. Dress is rhetorical. What that means is we convince people of things through the clothes we wear. And dress is generally intentional. You probably chose the clothes you're wearing right now. Uh, and if you did, whose fault is that? That's your fault. Uh, you should be conscious of what your clothes are communicating. People ask me a lot of times, should I dress up for a, sh for a speech? You know what I think? I think for most of our classroom speeches, a button-down collared shirt is more than appropriate. 
the jacket, the tie, not necessary. A lot of my students have been in the military and they've, you know, chosen their dress uniforms for their speech and I thought that was appropriate. A suit and tie is okay. But here's the thing. You need to think about what your dress is communicating and you need to make sure that is something you want to communicate. That's the main thing to keep in mind. If you dress like a gangster, then nobody has the right to treat you with anything but respect, but you shouldn't be surprised if people treat you like a gangster. If you dress like a prostitute, that doesn't mean anybody has the right to treat you with anything other than respect, but you shouldn't be terribly surprised when they treat you like a prostitute. Now that's not giving permission to anybody to treat anybody with anything other than the utmost of respect. But you need to decide how you want other people to think of you. And you need to keep that in mind. So, we've talked about how we communicate through our, through, through, through our movements, through our body, through our bodies, through our gestures. Okay, we've talked about how that impo important that is. And it is really important. A person who stands still in a speech is, to me, a bad public speaker. But there's more to just our sight than that. There's also more than just our gestures. There's also the way we arrange our space and the clothes that we choose to put on. All of this communicates to your audience and I hope that you can remember as you prepare for your speeches that you need to take charge of all of it. Your gestures, your movements, the way you dress, and the way you arrange the space. Thank you. As we go on next, we're going to start talking about our, uh, how we communicate non-verbally with our voice. And I'm going to teach you a little bit about your voice. I hope that whatever else you thought about these videos, that you haven't thought that I use my voice in a boring way. I'm almost never accused of being monotone. And we're going to talk to you, and we're going to find out how you can do this too. So stay tuned. Watch the next video. The next video is going to deal with communication and voice. Uh, we're going to continue with this canon of delivery, nonverbal communication. We're going to talk about how to use our voice. So stay tuned.